here we are in a reconstruction of Vermeer's studio. We are using Ars Pictoria, one of Vermeer's largest and most famous painting, to deduce how it was all set up. The painter David Hockney, in a recent television program, was in ecstasies about this painting. The room is so full of light, he said. He wanted to call it the craft of painting. It's so immensely about craft. And the range of blacks is fantastic, he said. Each of his shoes is slightly different, for example. Then there are all those dark browns which turn out to be not that dark when you compare them with the blacks and it's done with such incredible skill. He doesn't paint this mirror on his easel, but I ask myself, how did he see himself in back view? And the answer is he needed two mirrors. There's one on the, there and his big mirror, which we see painted in another painting uh, called uh, The Love Letter. Uh, we see it quite clearly. It's a long, tall mirror and its face is more or less on the floor. We have got a long, tall mirror. It does, it's not quite wide enough to be for mirrors, but it, it's enough to make the demonstration absolutely. Now, what Vermeer would have done, I think, is he would have fixed his eye point. I'll do that later with a frame here. And looking now in this mirror, I see the subject matter. That is, we put up Rembrandt there as a, a, a model for us. I can see the subject matter, and I can see myself in back view, sitting on uh, this chair. I see the floor, um, and I can see uh, the model and the view behind of the dresser with various things on it. Uh, we've spent a bit of time trying to reproduce, uh, to some extent, Vermeer's colour scheme. Uh, Anne Shingleton, who will be making the demonstration, is very knowledgeable about his ability to see colour and tone, which is very, very special in Vermeer's case. Vermeer is more or less the only artist of any stature known to us who put down mixed paint and put it down on his canvas without changing his mind in any great detail. It was all uh, put down and it's an immaculate, clean technique of painting because he saw in the mirror uh, what he was going to paint and he saw it to a very much greater extent than if he just looked at it in life. In fact, when he looks at it in life, he gets almost exactly the same view of uh, the head uh, because, of course, a mirror reverses, but two mirrors turn it back to the right place again. So we are, he's got the choice of looking at it in the mirror and his, or looking at it direct. Now, when you look at, at it direct, he sees, of course, light, pure and simple. When he looks at it in the mirror, the huge advantage, particularly of a 17th century mirror, which was used silver rather than mercury as its background, as its reflective surface, the huge advantage is that, that silver actually loses 30% of the light on each bounce. So 30% here and another 30% here. Vermeer could look at what he sees in the mirror and actually ma match paint with what he sees in the mirror. Now this is the crucial thing that previously, I mean all other painters who don't use this technique have to guess because the spectrum of light if you use a light meter on this, is huge. Use the same light meter on here, and it's very much smaller and very much closer 
to what the artist's palette can actually achieve. So that uh, normally an artist is guessing to make relationships that reflect what's going on out here, but they're nothing like uh, the, the true values. They are very, very much reduced because pigment simply can't do what light can do. With this shot, the camera is very far from where my eye is, but you can just see the back of my head, the reflection of uh, my face, and between them you can see Rembrandt himself in very restricted view. We'll try taking a still from where my eye is. Stedman, who, who wrote this book, uh, The Vermeer's Camera, was trained as an architect. He knows a great deal about the mathematics of drawing. And the book is uh, very good on the literature about Vermeer, what people have thought about it, and he very rightly singles out Lawrence Gowing as being the, the real expert. What people may not know about Gowing is that for the first half of his career, he was in fact a tonal painter, a very fine tonal painter. And so his response to Vermeer is very much a painter's response, whereas Stedman's is not really, it's a draftsman's response. And what uh, Stedman uh, says is that the actual layout of the painting uh, could have been done with something other than a camera obscura. It's, it's uh, not necessary to have a camera obscura. So the camera obscura actually gives you a very dim image. Uh, Gowing refers to it as a dark image. It's not useful at all in terms of catching this sense of light that Vermeer catches. This, we'll hear from Anne, is very much more useful. So Stedman establishes fairly clearly that Delft and Vermeer's home was in fact a place where he could have come in contact with the most advanced optics of his time. I mean, there were three or four people there, one of whom invented a microscope, um, who could have been a friend, though there's no way we can establish that. But um, it, there's no doubt that he was in contact with the latest thinking about optics, and the uh, knowledge of uh, the anatomy of the eye would have been quite sufficient to show him that, like the camera, the eye does go out of focus, but it automatically focuses on the what you're paying attention to. So the one thing that you can't get from your eye, and which uh, Vermeer gets in his paintings, is by studying out-of-focus effects through the camera obscura, and which he paints with remarkable uh, accuracy from a kind of scientific point of view. He is acting as if he's the plate of the camera. He, he is uh, telling us exactly what it looks like out of focus, which he couldn't do with his eye. We, however hard you try, looking into the out of focus parts, you simply cannot get the results that Vermeer got. In fact, what I'm trying to show is that the camera obscura definitely was used. There's, there can't be any doubt about that, really. Stedman produces lots of evidence, and so does uh, Arthur Wheelock. Pieces of, of furniture out of focus and shows how incredibly like Vermeer's painting it is. And my point really is that the uh, camera obscura does not uh, answer 
the question, how did Vermeer paint his paintings? What does answer that question, very satisfactorily as far as I'm concerned, is the, the two mirrors which are definitely hinted at in uh, Vermeer's biggest painting and probably his most important and most famous painting, the artist in his studio. To me, it is a kind of cryptic description of the way he painted his picture, the way he, he observed the tonal qualities of the subject in front of him.